I've had the privilege of uh, getting to spend a little bit of time with, uh, with, with Mark and the leadership team, both in Orlando and then in Chicago and now here in Portland. And um, I'll tell you what, I am really um, just super grateful for all that God has accomplished uh, through the Mana House and through Mana House family. I'll tell you, just do me a favor and uh, just reach over next to somebody and pat them on the back and say, hey, well done, well done. Just do this, say, well done, well done. Okay, but I'll tell you what, as impressed as I am about the past, and I, I was just, I was telling Mark, I mean, the more and more I learn about what God is putting in place here, I mean, when, with, with the church and with the global family and the Bible college, and the, I mean, just goes on and on and on. I am telling you, as someone who kind of makes the rounds and I like to kind of play in some of this movement making stuff, there is everything here in place and you have great leadership in place to really see a great movement of God. And, and if I can be a friend, if there's any way I can be a part of it, I want to help with this. And if you're not yet all in, I would encourage you, if you're watching online too, you, you need to get all in on this. Because I do, I think we're going to look back 10 years from now and go like, wow, look at that. How God worked to plant tens of thousands of churches, both here in North America, but then also around the world. Can I get an amen on that one? All right. Um, well, I'll tell you what, let's do that in that case. Then I'll turn to somebody next to you and say, hey, there's a lot more to do. There's a lot more to do, all right? There's a lot more to do. That's right. There you go. Um, here's where we're going to go tonight. I remember I was pulling into my driveway, this is a few months ago, and I noticed a big orange moving truck pulling in next door. And when you see a mo big orange moving truck pulling in next door, you know what that means? New neighbors. That's exactly right. New neighbors. Now, getting new neighbors is kind of like the adult version. Remember when you were in school and there'd be like a new kid show up? Ah, oh, a new kid. I mean, could be my best friend, could, could be, who knows? I mean, and so, I mean, like these new neighbors, I mean, maybe, maybe they would be. Maybe they'd be like my new best friend or maybe they'd be like my old neighbors <laughs> who, uh, you know, they'd let their pit bull loose in the backyard. They got busted for drug possession, you know. It could kind of go either way, right? It could be this or it could be that. You never know with new neighbors. But here's the thing. No matter who my new neighbor turns out to be, here's what the Bible has to say. It says this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And guess what? It doesn't just say it one time. It doesn't say it two times. It says it eight different times. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Help me out. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's exactly right. Eight times. Eight times it says it over and over and over again. Love your neighbor as yourself. They call it the royal law. And it sounds so beautiful. And when it works, it is. It is. Now, sometimes it's not so easy. But I'll tell you what, but most of the time, most of my neighbors have been pretty, I mean, been pretty decent folks. So the real problem for me isn't so much kind of loving them, because that part's not really like hard, I guess. Yeah, I love my neighbor. The real hard part is how. How do I actually, in a tangible, clear, everyday way, <clears throat> do what the Bible is saying, love my neighbors? How do you, as a Christ follower, how do you love your neighbor? How is it, how do you intentionally show them the love of God? I'd love for you to wrestle with that a little bit, because I want to go there this evening. Here, here's what I want you to do. Do me a favor. And if you want to do it with your phone, you can do it with your phone. If you've got a piece of paper, that's great. If you're on your phone, you can send a text to yourself or get out the notes or if you just want to do it in your brain. But here's what I want you to do. I want every one of you right now to think of a new neighbor. Now, it might be literally somebody who moved in to your neighborhood or it might be somebody who's kind of in your, like you're in third place where you hang out, where you work out, where you, the coffee shop. It might be some place where you work or you play. Whatever it is, I want you to think about somebody new in your circle of influence, okay? And give me a little nod once you got it, okay? Give me a little nod, come on. How about you way back there, yeah? You're participating, good. Yes, 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 how are we doing here? Yep, oh wow, this is, I like the energy right there. <laughs> what about back over there, yes, 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 yeah? Okay, you got, you got somebody in your mind, I want you to think about that. Okay, as you think about it, I want you to ask, what is my plan to love them? How do I plan to show them God's love? How do I plan to show them Jesus? Because here's, here's the deal. When I first became a Christ follower, I was so pumped. I was so excited about the love of God and, and, and how the person of Jesus had changed my life. I wanted to share it with everybody. I mean everybody. And believe me, I tried. <laughs> In some of the most obnoxious ways possible. I mean, literally, I would, on the street, I would come up to you and I'd say, hey, 
If you were to die tonight, which is always a great way to approach somebody, right? You want to make a friend. If you were to die tonight and you were standing before God and he was to ask you, why should I let you, let you into my heaven, what would you say? Yeah, and they, they do the same thing. You're like, why are you, why are you talking to me like this? <laughs> and then I'd follow up with another question too. You know, and, and so I would assault people. It was unbelievable. I mean, I, I literally would assault people. What I found was I was actually asking them questions they weren't interested in answering. And sometimes I was answering questions that they weren't even asking. And what I found, I mean, as I would do this, and I did this I mean, through college and as a young adult, what I found is it was not effective. I mean, yes, I got some great stories about this one guy who I met, this hitchhiker I one time picked up, and I baptized him that same night. Of course, I don't tell the rest of the story about how he stole my car the next week and took off, okay? <laughs> So I got some of those stories, but I'm telling you, overall, I, I kind of looked at that and go, this is not a great way to show the love of God. So what I did is I said, you know, actually, I became a pastor. <laughs> and in becoming a pastor, I challenged the society, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit doing that, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to live like Jesus. I'm just going to live the life of Jesus, and, and people are going to be able to tell. Not so much with words anymore, because I saw the results of that. And so I just, I'm just going to live like Jesus. And you know what happened? People liked being neighbors with me because I was a good guy. I was a good neighbor. But I didn't really see anybody come to know Jesus. And I kept thinking to myself, there's got to be a better way. And, and honestly, then as a pastor, I thought to myself, not only do I want a better way for me, but I would love to have a better way for the people in my church. Now, for a long time, I was, I was familiar with what, what we refer to as God's blessing strategy. We'll throw it up on the screen here, okay, for how to reach the world. I mean, it's right there in Genesis 12. It's early on in that first book of the Bible, and it says this. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make your name great, and then you're going to, and you will be a blessing then to all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And basically what God was saying is, listen, here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to bless you, and then you're going to bless others. You're going to be, help me out, blessed to be a Exactly right. Now, I'm going to keep it real here. I mean, it almost sounds like a pithy saying, doesn't it? I mean, blessed to be a blessing. It feels, seems like something you'd see on a bumper sticker or, you know, on a, I don't know, on, on a refrigerator magnet or something that gets crocheted on, your, on a pillow in your grandma's house. That's what it feels like, right? And that's kind of the way I thought about it. Oh, that, that's cute. It's blessed to be a blessing. But I'll tell you, I remember the moment when I realized that that was actually a God-given strategy, and here's the part, for how, how to love my neighbor. And if enough of us do it, maybe even change the world. And I mean, that's what motivated me to write the book. That's, that's one of the reasons I was excited about being here this evening with you all. And here's, here's one of the things that was a real game changer for me. And I, I'd like to say it came straight from scripture, but I have to say, actually, in Genesis 12, I looked at that and I saw it as a pithy saying. And it was a little bit of, a little bit of research that kind of pushed me back. I'm like, no, this is a real thing. And here was the research I found. And it was actually in a doctoral study, a doctoral study embedded in it. It was this study called Blessers versus Converters. I don't know if you've heard this or not. Called Blessers versus Converters. The study was based on two teams of missionaries, two different teams that both went to Thailand. They both went to Thailand, but they went with two distinctly different missional strategies. Okay? You got blessers and converters. The converters, they went with the sole intention of trying to convert people, to evangelize people. Back in the day, they would say this way, we're going to save souls. Can I get an amen? <laughs> All right, there you go. That's what they thought. Then you had the blessers. The blessers said, you know what? We're going with intention. We're, we are going to be a blessing. We're going to be a blessing to people. We're, whoever God sends our way, we intend to be a blessing to them. They followed these two teams of missionaries for two years, and, and they discovered a lot of things, but two big things that came out of this. First of all, what they discovered is the blessers, their presence in the community actually created tremendous amounts of what they call social capital. It made it a better society, a better, there was a better community life because they were present. That wasn't so with the converters. But the second thing that they found, this was the most surprising, was that the blessers had 50 times as many conversions as did the converters. <laughs> and when I say what they found over the course of two years, they saw about 100 folks say yes to the love of God and follow Jesus, whereas the converters had two. 
And I kind of stepped away from that going, okay, hold on, look at this. Then maybe this blessing strategy really works. Maybe the best way to love your neighbor, maybe the best way to share God's love is by being a blesser. I also ran across some stuff then from the, from the Barna group. This is more recently. It's eye-popping stuff. Where the Barna Research Group asked, okay, they asked your friends, they asked your neighbors, those people you're thinking about, maybe you got that person in your mind I asked you about, they asked them. They asked them this question. What would you value in a person with whom you would be likely to talk about spiritual matters? Basically, what would, you, what would that person you're thinking about, you got in mind, I asked you to think about, what would, they, what would they be looking for for someone with whom they would trust to talk about spiritual matters? Three, three qualities came to the top, and here they are. Number one, they said, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who will listen to me without judgment. I'm looking for someone who will listen to me without judgment. Listening, and I'm having to learn this. Listening is one of the purest acts of love that you can offer somebody. And here's the sad news. The sad news in this survey is that two-thirds of the folks said they had nobody in their life that would listen to them without judgment. Nobody. And I'll tell you what, as I reflect on my early attempts, okay, to share the good news, my focus was always on what I would say, <laughs> okay, what question I would get to ask. Never about listening. In fact, even when I was pretending to listen, I was actually preparing my response because I had something really important that they needed to hear from me. And I think people are looking for, maybe particularly today, for someone who will listen without judgment. And here's the thing I love about this, okay? That's something we are all capable of doing. We can all do this. Here's the second quality they said they were looking for. They said they were also looking for someone, here's who I talk to about spiritual things, your friends, my friends, okay? I'm looking for someone who will allow me to draw my own conclusions. Who will allow me to draw my own conclusions. And here's the thing, I had to get this too, because I didn't get it, and I think we all need to get this. Your friends, your non-Christian friends, your unchurched friends, they are not projects, they are people. And guess what, I mean, think about your own journey. Think about how many times you have and you did, you screwed up, and somebody loved you anyway. Maybe we ought to do the same, allow them the same kind of grace, let them screw up, let them make mistakes, but we just keep loving them anyway. Trust them the same way that God trusts us to have their own spiritual journey. And again, I think about my own early failed attempts, and I think my heart was in a good place. Okay, my heart was in a good place. I had good motivations, but my strategy and tactics were just brutal. Okay, I knew the outcome I wanted. I wanted them all to say yes to Jesus. I wanted to baptize them that night, right? Good intentions, poor tactics. Here's the third quality. The third quality they said they were looking for. This is your friends, okay? Here's what they're looking for. Number three, someone who has the confidence in sharing their own perspective. So here's what I understand. After you've listened to your friend, and after you've given them space to come to their own conclusion, it's then and only then that the people around us, then they want to hear, then they want to hear us confidently share our perspective. You know, I, I call this paying the relational rent. You have to invest enough in other people by listening to them and loving them, no matter what, they ultimately decide. We're gonna be their friends. No matter what. It's then you'll have a permanent place in their life and then possibly you'll be able to tell them your story with confidence about how Jesus has changed your life and how the love of God just is a game changer and an eternity altering. Okay, and so with all this kind of, with the, the blessing strategy and kind of this influx of research and data, I began to look at the life of Jesus, and you know what I discovered? This, this, this is a lot how Jesus did it. Think about this, okay? Listen without judgment. You go back, Jesus listens to other people's questions way more, and asks questions so we can listen, way more than he, than he gives answers. Way more. He also allowed other people to draw their own conclusions. Think about the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler, he comes to him, right? And he says, here's, here's, here's what you gotta do. You gotta sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And, and the guy's like, uh, I can't do it. And he, what does he do? He lets him draw his own conclusion. He trusts him with that. With that. And he also, at, at the right time, he confidently shares the good news. He says, no, I am the way. I'm the truth, the life. 
And so the more I began to study this, the more I began to see kind of some, some particular missional practices that Jesus used over and over and over and over again. And what we did is, because I wanted, I wanted to give handles to the people in my church, okay, to be able to do it the same way Jesus did. And so what we did is then we took and we kind of put it in, in, in this really simple, memorable acronym called BLESS. And here's what I would love to do. I would love to pass these along to you because I, th- I think particularly now in, this, in a post-Christian, post-modern era that we live in right now, I think I, people do not come pre-evangelized and we have got to pay the relational rent. And I think, here, I think that's what Jesus did and here's how we're going to do it. Let me, let me just give it to you. B-L-E-S-S, all right? You better remember this. You better pass this along. It's, it's simple and reproducible. The B is this, okay? The B stands for, and that's a little bit of a stretch, but work with me on this, begin with prayer, <laughs> okay? They get better after this. Begin with prayer, all right? Prayer is both how you discover your mission, think about this, but also how you do the mission. And, and when, Jesus, when Jesus started his earthly ministry in Luke chapter six, what does he do? He goes out in the mountain, it says, and he prayed. So just like Jesus, the way we begin our own missional approach to reaching the people and sharing the love of God with the people around us is we begin with prayer. And here's what we have to remember. God is already at work. Some of us as church planners, we move into a new neighborhood and we think we kind of brought God with us. No, God has already been at work there for a long, long time. All right? And so what you need to do is you go like, hey, where's God at work? And I would encourage you, you walk your neighborhood. Just walk your neighborhood and start praying. Start praying for every house. Start praying for, for, for every apartment. Start, just start praying for those folks. And I would encourage you too, to get to know their names. Get to know their names. And, or maybe on your way to work, if you walk to work or you take a, the, the, the bus or the train to work or you drive to work, just pray on the way to work. Or if in the morning, like I do, I, I stream the news on my phone. I'll watch, and, I'll, and just sometimes I'll just pray. Pray for my city, all the, all through all the news stories, just pray. Ask God, who do you want me to bless? Who do you want me to bless? And I gotta warn you, when you start doing this thing, some exciting, kind of adventurous, even dangerous kind of stuff starts to happen. A favorite story of mine along these lines is, is a guy named Louis. Louis, he's a funny guy. Lou, Louis was a guy, he went to the mall. Louis went to the mall, and for whatever reason, he's at the mall, and he notices this guy sitting on a bench. And Louis inside gets this strange sensation that says, go tell this guy that God loves him. And Louis doesn't want to do that, right? I mean, do you? Come on, keep it real. Yeah. Right? No, you're going like, seriously? You know, what are you going to walk with? Hey, God loves you. Then what do you say after that? I don't know, right? So you don't, and so he did what you, or what I would do. You, I mean, you get this, at least a lot of times you go, no, I'm not doing that. So he shrugs it off. He's walking around the mall. He comes to another place, another part of the mall a little bit later on. Seems to, sees the same guy. Same guy sitting in a different place. And again, he kind of gets this inner nudge, go over there and tell him that God loves him. Well, he blows it off again. Well, it happens a third time. Okay, this happens a third time. Sees the same guy, same kind of feeling, same kind of nudge, same kind of prompting. And, and finally, Louis goes, all right, what? all right, God. Walks up to this guy and says, I don't want to seem weird or anything. <laughs> Too late for that. <laughs> but I feel like I'm supposed to tell you that God loves you. The guy's eyes widen and fill up with tears. And he says, this morning I was at the end of my rope and I just shot a prayer to heaven and I said, God, if you're real, you show me your love today. And then he told Louis, and he said, and you are the third complete stranger to come up and tell me that in the mall today. (laughs) Now, that's a great story because we gotta have great stories for talks like this, right? But that's the kind of stuff we need to begin with prayer. You begin, that, that's, where the, that's where how you share the love of God with someone. If you want to bless somebody else, you begin with prayer. Now, that's the first thing you do. And I have, actually, I should grab my journal down here. I have eight different folks that I pray for on a daily basis. And I just pray for those folks, pray for those folks by name. Then the second part, the L stands for listen, okay? B stands for give with prayer. L stands for, for listen. If you read the Gospels, Jesus was, like I mentioned before, Jesus was constantly asking questions and then listening. Listening to folks. Uh, One of my favorite storytellers is a guy named Michael Frost. He tells this great story about an American missionary who went to a remote place in India. And uh, the missionary, he was very motivated, motivated by the gospel, motivated by compassion for these people. Met with a group of community leaders in this remote place. 
and began to suggest a variety of different programs that he could bring to their community. And in fact, he was very well resourced. He said, if you would like, one of the things I could do, I, we, we could actually, <clears throat> we have enough dollars, we could, we could build a whole school. If you wanted, if it would be more helpful, we could, we, could, we could build a hospital. Or if you want, we could, we could build a church. It could be like a community center. And, and he was kind of selling them on this whole thing. He was really excited about this. He says, so what do you want to do? And the Indian people said, um, could you get us a mailbox? And he was kind of frustrated. He thought they didn't understand. So he went through it all again, right? He's like, no, I mean, I, I, I come from a place people are excited about this, and they've resourced me with real dollars, and we can get behind this. We could, we could build a hospital. We could build a school. We could build a church. And I mean, I would love to serve you in your community. We could do this kind of thing together. What do you say? And once again, they said, could you get us a mailbox? And so now he's a little bit, he's still confused. He's, okay, why a mailbox when I could do so much more? And they went on to explain, they said, well, if we could get an official mailbox in this remote place out here, like a P.O. box, that would actually put us on the map. And if we could get on the map, then we would actually be recognized and eligible for all the government programs that we've never been have, able to have access to. Could you just get us a mailbox? You know, it, it, in Luke chapter 18, it's like Jesus with the blind man. I love this part. Go back and read it again. Notice what happens here. Jesus doesn't assume that the blind man wants to see. What does he do? First he asks the question, what do you want me to do? He teaches the man with dignity. And see, I think that, that's, that's what I was doing when I was assaulting people. I wasn't doing when I was assaulting people on the street. I was not treating them with any dignity. I felt like I knew better what they, they needed than they did. I love this quote too. The inventor of the stethoscope used to tell young doctors this, okay? The inventor of the stethoscope would say this, listen to your patients and they'll tell you how to heal them. So the first thing you have to do is think about that person. I already, you already did. You begin by praying with them. When you get the opportunity, then you listen to them first. Listen to, the, listen to their life, listen to their pain, listen to their story, listen to them. Listening is, is just a great act of love. Then here's the, the, the E, this third practice. This is my personal favorite. I think it's something you're all gonna be experts at, and I expect a round of applause after this. Okay, the, there we go, here we go. The third missional practice is this E for eat, okay? Kinda, there we go, right, eating. But I'll tell you what, go back and read the Gospels. Jesus did this a lot, didn't he? I mean, think about Jesus with Zacchaeus. I mean, there, there's, there's something <clears throat> about sharing a meal together that moves any relationship past acquaintance to friendship. I mean, I, I remember, I mean, my wife Sue and I, we'd gone out a couple times, but it's that first time we were at Aurelio's Pizza on the south side of Chicago. I mean, it did. It went from kind of, you know what, we're not just friends. I think this thing's got potential. Right? It moves it from acquaintance to friendship, fashion almost anything else we can do. And there are a few things we can, that we can better bless people with than sharing a meal with them. So the E stands for eat. But let me ask you this. Just think about this. How, how many times, uh, I think this is a rhetorical question, but you can answer. How many times do you eat a day? How many meals a day, people? Three. Most of us say three. Okay. And so if you eat three times a day, you got seven days a week, that's 21. And what I love about this, there are 21 existing missional opportunities for you without adding anything else to your schedule. I mean, that's what we do at church. We invent programs that people have to be a part of. <clears throat> and one of the things I love about the blessed practice, this is not something you add to your life. No, this becomes, this is how you do your life. I gotta eat anyway, why don't you come with me? I'm gonna hang out at Starbucks anyway, hey, why don't you join me there, right? That's what we're talking about here. Alan Hirsch and Lance Ford, they wrote a, Terrific little book called Right Here, Right Now. And they talk about this. Let me read this quote to you. Alan's a friend of mine. I love this. He says, sharing meals together on a regular basis is one of the most sacred practices we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. I love this next line. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. <laughs> He goes on, imagine if every Christian household regularly invited a stranger or a poor person into their home for a meal once a week. We could literally change the world by eating. I mean, that sounds like the most fun evangelistic program I've ever heard. Change the world by eating. And I think they're right. Imagine if we did that. We began to regularly just eat with our neighbors. 
with our coworkers, our friends who don't know Jesus. I think we could bless the world just by eating with them. So here we go. So you begin with prayer. You got these people, like eight of them, I would suggest, that you pray for on a regular basis. You're looking for opportunities where you're just, first of all, you're listening to them. You're going to know them. They're setting the agenda. And then you want to you move past acquaintance to friendship. And so you begin to, you begin to eat with them, share meals. And I'll tell you what, when you do those first three things, here's what will happen. You're going to become friends. The, the, in some ways, I kind of get a kick out of giving this talk because it's, it's basically like a remedial course on how to make friends. <laughs> Am I right? Are, are, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that your wife there? Okay, I bet you anything, I bet you anything, I don't know if you prayed about it or not, maybe you did, but I bet you before you guys ever started getting really serious, you did a lot of listening, a lot of conversation, and you probably took her out to eat. Am I right? Absolutely. All right, and look at that. Isn't that awesome right there? <laughs> Evangelism at its best. And what happens when you become friends, this is, you develop an intimacy with this person, and then they will tell you, they will tell you how you can serve them. Because by that point, if you've done enough of that, <clears throat> you're going to know what's going on with their kids. You're going to have a hunch about what's going on in their finances. You're going to know that they think their job sucks. They're going to know that they're struggling in their marriage. You're going to know those things because well, guess what? At this point, you are friends. And what was the nickname, by the way, that Jesus had? Exactly right, friend of sinners. Not converter of sinners, friend of sinners. Friend of sinners. And so and he said, hey, my job here, my mission here, is not to be served, but to serve. So the S, that first S, okay, stands for serve. There's, there's a famous letter written to, to a, a Roman elite by the name of uh, Diognetes. I don't know if you've heard this or not. And, it's, and, he, and he's asked, Diognetes asked, who wrote this letter, to describe the early Christians. Because he'd heard about them, but he wanted the truth about them. Why was it these early Christians were changing the world? And here's how this, th th this person describes, he wasn't a believer, but describes the early Christians to this Roman elite, Diognetes. He, he writes this, he says, for Christians cannot be distinguished from the rest of the human race by country, language, or custom. They do not live in cities of their own. And what he's saying here, I'll just kind of break this down. They don't cluster themselves alone. They don't leave anyone out. And, and specifically, he was referring to the observation that Christians were not racist. That's what he's saying. And he goes on, and then he says, in fact, they have a share in everything as citizens, and they endure everything as foreigners. They marry like everyone else, and they beget children. Check this, this next line. But they do not cast out their offspring. And what he's referring to then, back then, mainly, families only wanted baby boys. And if they had a baby girl, it would not be uncommon for them to take the baby into the woods and leave it there to die. But the Christians were actually known, go back and read a little church history, early Christians were known, they would actually go into the woods to save that baby girl and bring them home to live with them. This is the kind of people they were. He goes on and describes this, they share their table, talk about hospitality, they share their table with everyone, but not their marriage bed. And he's talking about exactly what you're talking, he's talking about. Christians were known for their hospitality, opened up their homes to all classes of people, but at the same time, they had a radical commitment to their marriage partner. In contrast to the Romans, okay, who were known to, to, to open themselves up to have sex with just about anybody, but they wouldn't share, them, share a meal with anybody who was outside their social equal. That was a distinguishing mark of Christians. And then he goes on, he says this, it's true that they are in the flesh, talking about the Christians, he wasn't one, but he's describing, they are in the flesh, but they did not live according to the flesh. They busy themselves on earth, but their citizenship is in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their own law, lives, they go way far beyond what the law requires. They love all men, and by all men are persecuted. They are reviled, and I love how it ends. They are reviled, and yet they bless. And yet they bless. That's how, they just, that's how the early Christians were described by non-Christians. And I would love to know, what if someone wrote a letter about us? Someone who wasn't a believer wrote a letter about us. What would it say? And so I would encourage you, you begin with prayer for those folks. You listen to those folks. You get to know them. Pay the relational rent. You eat with them. Now you're becoming like real friends. Genuine, like real friends, which is kind of cool. It's not such a bad thing to have an extra friend, right? This is not such a bad thing. Who doesn't need more friends? Real friends. And then when they as the like a good friend would, that first S is you serve them. 
And I'll tell you what, my experience too has been, when you do that, begin with prayer, listen, eat, and you serve them, you'll have the opportunity, because now, you're, I mean, you, you are, you're, you're tight. You'll have the opportunity to share with them, yeah, here's, here's how God's love has changed me. Here's how, here's how following Jesus has impacted both this life and I anticipate in faith the next life. You share your story. You share your story. And here's the thing. I, proclamation is important. What's happening here right now? Proclamation is important. It just doesn't have to happen first. It doesn't have to happen first. I, I want to tell you about my friend Michael. Um, the first time that church of any kind came up with my friend Michael, he, he told me, he told me, just knowing certain terms, he, he would, I, I won't tell you exactly what he said, it, but he was mad at God and he thought church, well, put the, he thought church was a bunch of BS. All right? That's what he said. Part of it's his story, Michael's story. Michael grew up in an abusive home. Um, he moved out of the house when he was 15 years of age, finished high school on his own, um, made his way to college, actually was a D1 athlete in track and field, almost ran a four minute mile was a very successful D1 athlete, ended up marrying a, a, a beautiful young lady as his wife, started his own company in the medical industry, was president of that, and, and did very well for himself. But as I got to know Michael, because both our boys ran cross country and track, okay, that was the thing we had in common. I'll never forget, he told me, he said, for 20 years, 20 years, he told me, for 20 years I felt like I've had the burden of not just living one life, but living two lives. I had the burden of not just living one life, but two lives. And of course, there's a backstory when someone says something like that. And the backstory was this. Michael was in grad school out in California, and his best friend, Jay, and him went out for a drive. Michael had been in Jay's wedding uh, as a best man, and Michael was now engaged, and Jay was supposed to be in his wedding. Michael said Jay was just this terrific human being, very spiritual guy, a moral guy. He said he was the kind of guy I would like to have been like. They go for this drive, and they get in a car accident. Michael's driving. Michael survives. Michael's best friend does not. And Michael watches Jay die in the car. Michael was also found negligent. His friend's parents held him accountable for his son's death and wanted nothing to do with Michael. And so every day for the next two decades, he lived with the guilt and the shame of that he moved away from Southern California, never told the story to anybody. And now it's just inside 20 years, and every day he's feeling the burden of not just living one life, but living two lives, one for him and one for his friend Jay. In my bag down here, I got my, my journal, and uh, every day I write the word bless. I write the word bless, and then I have a list of at least eight people that I write their names there, that I pray for. One of the names for over three years was Michael. I, I prayed for Michael. He was on my list. Um, so I'm praying, beginning with prayer, right? And uh, we, we would go to track meets or go to cross country meets and uh, both our kids did pretty well at that and, and we loved our boys and because both of us had, actually had a couple of boys that ran cross country and track <clears throat> and uh, and so we love to talk about track, we love to talk about cross country. Sometimes we would have, you know, fly, we'd have meets where we were out of the states, so we'd have to travel. And so we, we got a lot of time to hang together and have conversations and I got to listen and get to know Michael and know some of his story and some of the tough stuff he went through growing up. Just to listen, begin with prayer, listen. Um, it actually wasn't me in this case, but actually I remember we were actually at a cross country meet and we were both standing behind like a backstop because the cross country, the run went around a backstop of a baseball field. And I remember Michael said something about, hey, you know, we ought to get together for breakfast sometime. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so we started getting together for breakfast. Or he also, he'd find a new restaurant he wanted to show me. We'd go to some new restaurant and um, we started eating together. I mean, this, this, it's just the stuff that friends do, right? We're becoming friends. I mean, he's, I, and I... I thoroughly enjoyed him as a friend. Well, Michael is used to being the boss. You know, I said he's the president of his own company. And I remember one breakfast we're together, and he, he just looks at me and goes, you know what, I have an executive coach who coaches me on how to run my business. I want you to be my spiritual coach. All right, deal. <laughs> that was hard sell. <laughs> right? And so we got a chance to start talking about spiritual things. And that's how I 
We got to serve him. Begin with prayer, listen, eat, serve. And we'd meet and we'd talk about, you know, our family, talk about running, talk about life, and sometimes we'd talk about spiritual things. I'll never forget the breakfast, though. The breakfast, it was at Egg Experience Cafe, and it was 20, almost 20 years to the day. And I, he told his wife, I'm not sure he'd ever told anybody else, he said to me, he said, it was 20 years ago that I killed my best friend. And it was like a confession that just kind of came out of him. He'd been eating at him for two decades. And it wasn't just that breakfast. I mean, it was the praying, it was the listening, the eating, the serving, the storytelling, mine, and I want to be clear, and a whole bunch of other folks. But that was the day I got to see Michael say yes to Jesus. Yeah. And what was even, in some ways, even more powerful than him saying yes to Jesus, I got to see God's redemption at work, how God could take something that haunted this guy for 20 years, and all of a sudden, I mean, just it felt like on the dime, God started using it for good as he started sharing his story. And I got to help my friend, my friend, Michael, come to the love of God and become a follower of Jesus. And uh, here's Michael, just to tell, this goes back a couple years to tell his story. I really did not have a relationship with God. And I did not think about it, it wasn't a goal or objective of mine. And my mentality was, if you wanna get something done, you can only really rely on you. And so that's the way I approached the world. Um, for, for many, many years. My name is Michael Kinney. I'm married to Stacy, and I have four children, Austin, Zachary, Aiden, and Zane, and I've been coming to community for two years. Jay was my roommate in graduate school. So February um, of 1997, Jay and I went to go see a concert. And on the way home from that concert, um, back to our apartment, um, we were in a car wreck. Jay um, died in the car wreck, extremely emotionally. Uh, devastated by the loss of my friend and I felt very responsible and I was very very angry um, with God so I decided then that I'm gonna live two lives one for me and one for Jay and I just I began trying to do that um, through my activities everything that I would achieve it never was enough it never made me feel differently I still felt very um, angry very alone it, you know, it didn't matter how hard I tried or what I accomplished, um, something was still missing. I just kept um, you know, walking around carrying these bags of bricks, um, never even considering putting them down and maybe asking for help. And my oldest son, Austin, he began going to church with his good friend, Caleb. I remember he got baptized and it really took me aback that he had, on his own, you know, figured out something that I could never figure out. And so I began going to church with a more open mind, trying to pay attention to the signs and to um, the messages that people were sharing with me. I also have a son who has severe autism and he has you know, no ego. And so I have this wonderful reflection of what Jesus Christ looks like without ego with my son Aiden. So the combination of um, watching Austin and watching and reflecting on my relationship with Aiden really turned my views from egoicism and hubris to humility. And then I was invited to go to a small group and I knew sort of what that was, but I didn't really know what it was. I'd never been in a small group. And I was very nervous. I mean, very nervous to attend my first session, particularly the subject was on regret. Um, I remember thinking, wow, um, how apropos that my first small group is on the subject that I need to learn the most about. And it really opened my eyes. The, the kind of the tipping point for me was on the 20th anniversary of this car accident, which killed my friend. It's a dark day for me, a very upsetting uh, day. And my family doesn't have any idea, except for my wife, why am I so upset? Um, not just all of the time, why am I sort of angry all of the time, but why am I particularly upset this day? What I found was that after I started sharing this story, particularly you know, with my family, and then in some cases with my close friends, that every single time I talked about what happened, it was like I was taking a brick out of the bag and putting it on the ground, and my load was just getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And every single time I did it, I felt better. For most of my life, I thought that asking for help was a sign of weakness. 
And what I've come to realize is that asking for help is really a sign of strength. And then if you really want some help and you want to really want to go to the right place, the best place to go is asking God for help and accepting Jesus into your life. Um, and it was uh, the Easter after that February that I got a chance. I, this is just a, this is me getting to baptize uh, Michael, along with his son Austin there. All right. I know we, we have uh, some church folks, and we also got a whole bunch of pastor types here, too. Here's the thing. Like, as pastors, I mean, you regularly get to baptize folks, and that's awesome. That is awesome. But this was different, right? That was my friend. That was my friend. And part of the reason I was excited about getting the chance to share this with you is I want that for every one of you. That big orange truck that moved in next door is Ray and Nikki. And so for the last uh, year now, every day, Ray and Nikki are in my journal. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I mean, Ray comes out of the house now. Because, you know, in Chicago, you got winters. You don't see anybody for a couple months. So it's now starting to get warm again. And I, and I saw him the other day. And he said, hey, Ray! You know, it's almost like too excited. You know, because I've been praying for him all winter. <laughs> yeah. I want that for you all. Here, here's the challenge I'd leave with you, Okay. Do one of those five practices every day. These are simple. And here, sometimes Christians go, well, well, does it count if I just pray? Yes, it counts, okay? It counts. Just pray. Or listen. Or share a meal. Or if you get a chance to serve. Or share Just do one of those. You're going, every day we're going to do one of those practices. And then either in your small group, or you're going to form some kind of a little group where at least once a week you're going to ask each other, hey, who did you bless this week? Who did you bless this week? So you kind of keep it top of mind. Because I think a lot of us, okay, yeah, we, we know, we know, we know we're supposed to love our neighbor, right? This is how. This is how. This is how you love your neighbor. And here's the thing that excites me. If enough of us do it, if enough of us do it, we might just change the world. We might just change the world. Let's pray. Father God, I want to say thanks. I want to say thanks for... Uh, I know, I know the people here in this room, the people online, they love you and they want to love their neighbor. We want to be obedient to what you instruct us to do. And we would love to do it exactly the way Jesus did. Lord, we thank you for your example. We thank you that the, you, this, this gives us the how, how we can also be friends of sinners. And Lord, I ask that through the power of your spirit, you work in each of us. And I pray for every person here in this room and also that's watching online that they have the, they have the opportunity in, 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 the, in the next year or two to see one of their friends, one of their friends, say yes to Jesus and know the love of God. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.